All right, as, as Daryl said, we've got the DIRT trilogy here. And uh, I kind of see these books as sort of one big nutrient cycle in a way. Even though it says part two up here on the screen, uh, I'm going to kick it off. You can certainly go back, and when Dave's talk is available, he is going to ground you in the ground with soil and how we get it back to soil from its current state of dirt. He's also going to talk more about that uh, third book there, Growing a Revolution. Um, for my part, what I'm going to do is draw on the hidden half of nature, sort of insights from the microbial world, both in the soil and the human body. And I'm going to kind of mash that up with the latest book, What Your Food Ate, and how all of this kind of mixes together to tell us really what the implications and consequences are of how we practice two of humanity's greatest endeavors. And they are these two things, agriculture and medicine. And it's my hope that we can begin to knit these two endeavors together much better than we have because they have an awful lot to do with one another, but we don't think about it that way. And so I'm picturing, you know, I would really love to see at, you know, the next Grazing Summit event, I would like to see some doctors and those in the uh, healthcare profession in this room. And I would like to see some of you at maybe some medical conferences. Because, like I said, we get, it's too siloized, and these two things really are very much connected. All right, and when I talk about the microbial world, what I'm really talking about are microbiomes. And I just want to give you a kind of a quick set of points about microbiomes. First of all, they are supposed to be on us and in us. This is sort of, you can picture it as, you know, nature's indigenous micro community for every single host organism that is carrying its microbiome. And microbiomes, the specialized communities, they dovetail intimately with our own cells and tissues and even our own genes. And this third point is actually kind of one of my favorite things. Microbiomes are incredibly transformative, and it has to do with the diet that their host organism is consuming. And as I'll get into, you'll see uh, both what I mean by transformation, and also right away, I just want to also uh, make a point about this word that we hear a lot, nutrients. You really need to broaden your mind when I use that word, because it's not just about growth and development, right? Whether you're a plant, a person, a ruminant, you start out small, you grow all this biomass, but the real trick is keeping that biomass healthy. And that's where a lot of what we talk about and what your food ate will come in. Okay, so who are some of these microbiome players? Now, here's one thing about the microbial world. First of all, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that the microbial world is all puppies and kittens and warm and fuzzy because we've been through a pandemic. Our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents went through plagues, diseases, and so on. And at the root of a lot of those was some kind of microbe. So that has been a part of the microbial world, but it is not by any means the entirety of the microbial world. So this is where we really need to hold two thoughts together in our minds at the same time. There is nuance here, and this nuance is about context. Because microbiomes can turn on a dime when you start changing their habitat and their context. They're also rule breakers, okay? Because I could stand up here and tell you all microbes, they're just single-celled creatures. And then, oh, hmm, well, fungi, can sometimes break that rule. Protists, stuff like amoeba. Some of these uh, can be multicellular creatures, so we're gonna throw that away. Okay, they're all living, wrong. Viruses, technically, are not alive. But by and large, this is what I want you to know about microbes. They are tiny, 
they number in the trillions, and they are transformative. Okay, and like I said, everything has one. Now the point here is, it's kind of a hairball of a slide, okay? Don't try to get into that too much. My main <clears throat> uh, point for showing you this is, you see all these circles up here. Those all represent different groups. This happens to be just bacteria, so those other microbes I showed you are not represented here. But this is all the different kinds of major taxonomic groups that are comprising the microbiomes of all of these organisms. And when I say taxonomic group, I'm not just talking about species. I'm talking about clear up to, to phyla. So these are large groups of bacteria, and there are, wow, one, two, three, and so on. There's an awful lot of them. So the point here is that there's a lot of biodiversity in microbiomes, not only within the same organism. Here you can see in this ruminant, the colon is different than the rumen. Just look at the proportion of that circle taken up by that lavender color in the colon versus in the rumen. So this gets at function. Microbiomes, depending on who exactly is in this community that they're a part of, they're all doing different things. And likewise, in the botanical world, that orange part of these circles, look how different that is in corn, beans, and rice. So the point, again, here is that there's as much diversity within a host organism as there is between host organisms, depending on where on the body or in the body these microbial communities are living. All right, so that kind of grounds you in the basics uh, of microbiomes, and I want to launch now into the botanical world with plants. I myself am kind of a plant person, although I have to say I do have a fondness for ruminants that I didn't have before writing what your food ate. Uh, and so, but this all gets going uh, in the ground with soil and with plants, where there is an absolutely wild and alive place that we call the rhizosphere. So you just need to picture this as a halo-like zone all around the root system of a plant. And it's very narrow. It's maybe a couple millimeters to a nanometer or so. And in that rhizosphere, there's kind of an engine that is driving all of the activity in the rhizosphere. It is said to be one of the most life-dense place, places on this planet, is around the root system of a plant. And I'm sorry to say that being underground, it's kind of out of sight. And so it makes us, it keeps it out of our mind. But I hope that by the time you leave here today, that this really is indeed in your mind. All right, so this is what we call a plant, plant exudate. So plants are manufacturing all kinds of compounds and molecules called exudates, and they exude them out of their root system because they are going to feed their microbiome. The lion's share of the plant microbiome is not in the fruit or the seed or the leaves or anything like that. It is down in the rhizosphere. And really, as a biologist, I look at this and it is one vast biological bazaar. And there are all kinds of trades and exchanges going back and forth in this biological bazaar. And so, Oops, what we've got is these exudates are flowing out. The fungi and bacteria down in the soil, they, they obviously cannot photosynthesize, and they're reliant on their plant host for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So really, exudates are meals for microbes. That's what you need to know. And we've got fetching fungi. They tend to, I think of them as the miners and truckers. They are way off in the other corner of the room, say, at the scale of this slide, mining all kinds of things out of rock fragments and out of soil particles. We know phosphorus is a big one that they can collect and transport back to their plant host, but also trace minerals, stuff like iron and zinc, which we know this is important for plant growth. So that's what our fetching fungi can do. Bacteria, this is mostly what we know about the, the plant microbiome, 
They can't get up and go anywhere. They are right next to the root. They're coating and swathing it. They are, in some cases, actually living inside of the root. This is where our nitrogen fixing bacteria come into things. So these microbes, these bacteria, are consuming these exudates, and they're doing a couple different things with them. They're either using the energy they derive from those exudates to produce particular kinds of compounds and molecules, like plant growth promoting hormones. So here, the dang botanical world has farmed out a portion of what it really needs to this other world, the microbial world, its microbiome, to be able to grow. Uh, bacteria will also manufacture on their own certain compounds that will spur a plant's immune system to jump into action. And so these relationships, these are some of the grandest symbioses that we know about on this planet, and they far predate what we often think about when we think about plants, which is pollinators and plant coevolution. You know, the hummingbird beak going into the flower and how did all of that happen? These kinds of relationships are just as co-evolved, just as intricate, and just as important. And that's why we need to think about what is going on here when it comes to farming practices as well as ranching practices, because we want the plant to continue all the time to be making these exudates, right? That's kind of the fuel that is running this underground economy. And it's an important, important thing. Biology is mercilessly efficient when it comes to energy. They do not waste, nothing is wasted. Plants are taking about 30 or 40 percent of this energy that they pull in through photosynthesis, and they're using that energy to make all of these exudates. That is big. That is huge. It would be as though, you know, any one of us took our paycheck and went and set it out on the sidewalk and then walked away from it, right? We're not doing that. If you're doing that, hopefully you're getting something, you know, in return. Maybe you're paying the plumber or the electrician, so on and so forth. You get the idea there. Stuff, stuff is happening uh, between these exchanges that you really want to support and to promote. All right, so that's, that's the living aspect of things. This also is key. So microbial necromass, what do you think that is? That's, that's microbial carcasses, trillions of them. Because all of these microbes are dying, of course. They're sitting there in the soil. And I thought that this research was really, really interesting because look at this. Up to 62% of the soil organic matter in your system, the grassland system, is coming from microbial carcasses. So this is another reason you want to really be sure that your microbiome down there in the soil is healthy, it's functioning, and it's productive. So it's part of the nutrient cycling that is really important for soil health. And I think in the end, this is really what I want to leave you with when it comes to the botanical world and its interactions with soil, with crops, and I'll get into with animals in just a bit. It's really a health plan. And it is really not so much about inputs, but it's about practices that support and safeguard all of this biology. Because when we do that, we're not spending money on inputs to compensate for that biology. OK, let's move on to the animals. And I have to say, this question popped up in my mind over and over again in researching and writing what your food ate. Sometimes I thought a ruminant was an animal. Sometimes I thought, wait a minute, there's an awful lot of plants involved in this life form. And then the miracle part, how these animals can turn plants into some of the most nutrient-dense foods on a weight basis of anything in the human diet. And so I really, really kind of think that ruminants are this kind of chimeric life form. They are, in fact, all three of these things, at least in how I think about it. And 
That has to do, of course, in part with this fabulous thing, the rumen. So here you got this microbial world swirling around in the rumen and this four-legged creature toting this thing around. And again, it's one of the grandest symbioses out there. Uh, Ruminants are one of the more specialized kinds of herbivores, right? They're really different than, you know, the great apes, really different than rabbits, really different than rodents. And this is what I think uh, too few people out there understand about ruminant biology and meat and dairy. And it is, in fact, the rumen, it's the, ri it's the rhizosphere equivalent of their body. It's the lion's share of their microbiome is sitting there in the rumen. All right, one of the high level takeaways in what your food ate was Dave and I, as we're moving through the research and writing of the book, things, a few things surfaced over and over again, whether crops, animals, or people. And we thought, okay, these things, this is the fab four. This is what it's all about. This is how stuff ripples up out of the soil into the plant body, animal body, human body, and all these four things are very important for the health of the organism all along the way. And in particular, for animals, I'm gonna focus on these three with the check marks next to them. The phytochemicals, fat balance, and microbial metabolites. And here, I just wanna remind you to think about nutrient writ large. Because microbial metabolites, that's not a carbohydrate. Those are not really calorie-based kinds of things. As you'll see, they're really about the health, the whole health of the organism. And what we know about phytochemicals is that the green body far surpasses anything like Monsanto or Syngenta or any of these chemicals that can be ginned up in a factory. Plants have a track record that goes back millions of years, and they have figured out how to turn their stuck-in-place lifestyle from one of a sitting duck to one that is thriving, surviving, and if they had their way, they would be blanketing the planet with their bodies. So phytochemicals are a huge part of the botanical lifestyle, and we know that many of the things that phytochemicals do for the plant body, they do for ruminants, as well. Now it's through different biochemical pathways, you know, we're talking mammals and, and plants, two really different life forms. But it's fundamental that these phytochemicals figure so much in the protection of both. And beta carotene is a phytochemical. Plants use it to protect themselves from the rays of the sun. And this is also why you'll find beta carotene in some sunscreens. It has the same protective effect on us. Defense is huge for the plant with their phytochemical cocktails. This is how they push back on herbivores of all sorts, including ruminants. The plant's objective, unlike a chemical company's maybe, it is we don't want to be killing things, not insects, certainly not ruminants. As you all know, and as Jerry described, there is a tightly locked connection between grazing and the health of grasslands. So these plants do not want to be killing off a part of what keeps them in business. What they really want to do with their phytochemicals is push that herbivore maybe off to some less healthy plant, all right? This is all that's achieved and this is all that's desired. And like I said, biology is mercilessly efficient. Why would you spend way more energy and way far more exudates than you needed to, to be feeding the microbial world that's helping spur production of phytochemicals. And lastly, this is a newer area, communication. Plants, when it comes to phytochemicals, they're using them as their language. You know, whether you think about that as a letter in a word, words in a sentence, a whole paragraph or a whole story. This is hugely important to the botanical world. It's how they tell one another about nearby nutrient sources, the approach of a pathogen, maybe even temperature fluctuations. And they will also share resources. And this is something that is um, 
a newer idea in biology because we always think of competition, competition, competition. But in fact, in the botanical world, they will often share exudates and share food between plants. There's a great book out there called The Mother Tree by a forester from British Columbia called Suzanne Samard, if you're interested in all, at all in this world of how uh, phytochemicals figure into uh, plant health. And there's thousands at least. We probably do not even fully understand, nor have we fully inventoried all the phytochemicals that are out there. All right, this is another fairly um, recent piece of research. I don't find this too surprising. If you're grazing your animals on phytochemically diverse, phytochemically rich diets, those phytochemicals, sometimes called phytonutrients as they are here, they're gonna transfer through into the tissue and milk of that animal. But in science, we like to know these things for sure because we can get a handle on uh, quantities and that, that begins to be the pathway to, you know, what are these quantities doing? Is it, is, it, is it the Goldilocks level? Too much, too little, and so on. So these folks uh, took a look at 22 studies and across the board they looked at, at these groups of phytochemicals that are listed up here, the carotenoids, tocopherols, the polyphenols, and the terps. And in a pasture in a concentrate uh, based diet, here's the upshot, two to 20 fold times higher levels of these beneficial phytochemicals. That's what we want. So this is that story in words, but maybe you're a picture person. And so this is showing us along this continuum, not much phytochemical richness in this kind of a diet. It improves, improves, improves. And this is where, when we think about grass-fed, I don't entirely like that term because it kind of implies monoculture. And what we really want to get across is botanical diversity into the ruminant's diet, in part because that relates to phytochemical diversity. So I don't have a, a, a great replacement word for grass-fed. Uh, it's kind of, I put it in that category with residue. It just does not get at the full picture or the full benefit of these aspects of, um, of ranching and farming. But again, here's the point. We really want to get species-rich mix of things. All right, I'm going to move now on to another, the other important one of the, the third of the fab four fats. And it was really interesting to me, uh, both as a meat eater consumer and someone who thinks about food a lot, to realize that so many of us, when we think about fat and fat profile, we think about the animal, right? Do we think of the fat of the land? Do we think about plants as fats? We don't, but we really, really should. And that has to do with this simple, simple fact. The leafy and the living parts of a plant are the photosynthetic parts of the plant, right? Roots, no, 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 their action is down there with their microbiome, that's not photosynthesizing. Woody material, not photosynthesizing. Seeds and so on, no. Only the leafy and the living. Turns out, photosynthesis requires an abundance of omega-3 fats in order for that biochemical process to function and function well. So this is why, as much as possible, we want animals to be having an abundance of the leafy living omega-3 rich plants in their diet. Now, of course, in a place like North Dakota, it's, right, like last night, not leafy and living out there, right? So, uh, but we know that ruminants, um, can adapt to all kinds of habitats, you know, from the tropical areas like in southern India to the Great Plains. So this tells us about sort of the adaptability of ruminants to all kinds of different habitats. And I also want to get, we can't, it's harder for us to relate to sort of the lifestyle of a plant. They're plants, we're people, unless you're someone like me, you don't maybe think about that a whole lot. It's easier for us with animals. And that's why I like talking about not just the leafy and living as a part of their diet, but 
it's actually an inherent part of the ruminant lifestyle, right? This is part of these animals' innate biology. They do well outside with an abundance of leafy living plants. Study after study after study shows that that's an omega-3 rich diet. And I will say another thing that I gained a huge appreciation for in writing this book was just how functional fats are. We usually think in biology about proteins being, you know, the big heavy hitters in terms of function. But the biochemistry of fats is one of the most complex and interesting areas, I think, in all of animal and human biology. We don't, we have, we, we're thinking about this all wrong if fat is just the stuff on our behinds and around our middles. It's having a lot of functions in the animal body and in the human body. And I'll contrast the sort of omega-3 rich lifestyle and diet with another kind. And this kind of gets back to plant biology. Remember, seeds are not photosynthesizers. They have a whole different job in the botanical world. And that whole different job means an abundance of omega-6 fats. And this is what kind of fuels the way a seed grows and develops, and most importantly, lands on the ground and germinates. And omega-3 fat is not a big part of that. Omega-6 fats are really important for that. But it's a bit troublesome to be having ruminants who, like I said, co-evolved as part of their biology to be out eating leafy and living. When too much of the diet goes toward the omega-6 end, it begins to wreak havoc, in particular with their microbiome, with that great rumen, that microbial world. And so this isn't to pit one fat against another, because really, as it turns out, and as I'll get into in a moment, it's really about the balance of fats. That's what it is. You don't want all omega-3s, and you don't want all omega-6s. So again, Hold, you know, two thoughts in your head at the same time. It's not one or the other. It's both in the right proportion and how you can get those given the system that you're ranching in or that you're raising your animals in. Um, on the whole, this is really what ruminants do best on. It's a diet that we choose for them because that's how it works most of the time. You can get them out there, and uh, if any of you know Fred Provenza, he writes eloquently and in detail about an animal's ability to self-medicate through choosing different combinations of plants throughout the course of the day and their lives. This is pretty fabulous. This is kind of the miracle part of the animal-vegetable miracle, that there's this constant communication going on between the rumen and the brain, the gut and the brain, that brings all this together. So this is really one, one, fat balance, diverse phytochemicals, and of course fiber. That's what all these microbes are thriving on down there in the rumen. They are fermenting all of that fiber to meet their own needs, and they also churn out a lot of microbial metabolites that benefit their host organism. And this is really another version of a health plan based on a fully functioning and robust microbiome. And I guess sort of the takeaway for me on ruminants, ruminant biology, and so forth, was to realize that the rumen is not just this fermentation chamber. That really bothered me in doing a lot of this research. It was called a bioreactor and a chamber and all of these things. It's really metabolic terrain for the animal. And this begins to tell you, oh, metabolism, that's going on all the time throughout the entirety of this animal's life, and we want that to be suited to the animal's biology. And uh, it also made me think about Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a French chemist. Pasteurization comes from his name. He started out as a chemist, but he went into microbiology, and in particular, deep dives. This is back in the late 1700s into the 1800s. Uh, into what's known as germ theory. He and his chief rival, Robert Koch, the German, were competing 
to figure out which pathogen is causing which of these diseases that are taking out the human population. And they realized most of the time there was a one-to-one -one correspondence. Oh, rabies comes from this thing, tuberculosis from this thing, and so on. On his deathbed, he is said to have come full circle to say, aha, there's another aspect to pathogens, and that is what is the terrain in which they live, right? So whether you're a microbe that's a fully functioning member of a microbiome or whether you're a pathogen, context or habitat plays a huge, huge role in what microbes can do to us and for us. All right. And of course, animal foods in the human diet, whatever that fat profile is, it ripples right on into us. And I found this um, pretty interesting. To, to, I, I was looking through some um, material the other day, and I think this summarizes nicely sort of what has happened with this omega-6, omega-3 ratio through time. So, of course, a long time ago, we're not quite at one-to-one. -one. Uh, as you move through time, you can see this ratio changing. This is about, it's thought, the ideal ratio, omega-6 to omega-3, is somewhere around equal parts to maybe a bit more on omega-6s. And I'll get into why this, uh, why this is so in just a bit. But first, uh, that's not bad. OK, that's not terrible. It's certainly nothing like this. So India, a huge country that we've often associated with uh, healthy diets, as urbanization has come on, dietary quality has totally changed. This is, this is not the omega-6, omega-3 ratio that you want at all. And in fact, we're not really a shining star there either. That's almost 17. And so you can sort of, where are, what has happened to tweak all of this? In part, it has to do with we've moved away from eating whole foods. We're eating animal products with meat and milk flooded with omega-6s. So our body takes that in, stores it in our cell membranes. And uh, the other thing is when we don't eat whole foods, a lot of things get refined out and tossed aside it messes with our metabolism, and this is a, another factor in all of this. I want to contrast sort of this, the changing omega-6, omega-3 ratio with something else about the human population. And this is a graph that shows that graph with the black lines. These are infectious diseases like Pasteur and Koch studied. And what it shows is that Right after World War II, all of these dread diseases, with the exception of a few, right? COVID is still with us, HIV is with us, but some of the most dread diseases of humanity, they're all, look at this, they're all plummeting. And this had to do with clean drinking water, that was a, a huge factor. Vaccines and antibiotics were also big factors because those impair the ability of pathogens to travel around as well as their virulence levels. But around the same time period, so people were patting ourselves on the back saying, this is all good, look at that, no more infectious diseases, or at least we're controlling them. But around the same time, oh my God, this whole other crop of chronic diseases starts cropping up. So chronic diseases generally do not have an infectious pathogen at their root. There's some disordered or perturbed uh, process that is happening with our metabolism, our nervous system, digestive system, you pick any major system in the human body and there's some chronic disease that is afflicting this. And what we know about a large number of chronic diseases is they also have some level of, they're, they're usually immune disorders of some sort and what I need to say about immunity is a vast subject area but you need to know this. Inflammation this is another thing, two thoughts in your mind. Inflammation is a double-edged sword. This is what helps us kick COVID out of our body, kill off a cancer cell, heal from a wound. You want inflammation going on. It's kind of our body's remodeling and fix it process. But we've all had remodeling projects. Sometimes a wall gets taken out that we didn't mean to have taken out, right? So while it's an expert kind of a way to fix things, you want it in and you want it out. So 
disordered inflammation is really what is thought to be at the root of this. And so what kind of a problem is this? Seven of 10 folks in the US, you can include Canada in this as well, have one or more chronic conditions. And a lot of times this can be controlled, but over time, it just lessens one's quality of life, especially as you age. So we want to prevent the onset of these things. Because like I said, usually you get a chronic disease, it's, it's hard to kick it, you can. You can get control of blood pressure and blood sugar, but it takes some doing. And so inflammation comes into this picture because it has been pretty only recently in the immunological world that folks, the folks that study this began to understand more about the inflammatory process. And what they realized, so you've got the onset phase, and this is like, oh, the immune system detecting a virus, a cancer cell, let's get on it. It is time to solve that problem. So it ramps up, inflammation starts, that problem is taken care of, and boom, you need it to end, right? We don't want chronic inflammation going on for weeks or decades on end. It's too destructive to our tissues and organs. So it turns out our smart immune system relies on components of the human diet to start inflammation and resolve the inflammation. And can you, I, I, I'm guessing some of you are headed in this direction. Omega-6s start and initiate inflammation and it's the omega-3s that resolve it. It used to be, sometimes biologists come up with kind of lame ideas. Before this was known, what they figured was, yeah, inflammation starts. Uh, I guess it just kind of runs out like gas in a car, and then it ends. No, that's just, that's too sloppy, that's not how it works. It was then later discovered that omega-3 fats, and there's different kinds of omega-3 fats, it's the longer chain ones. These things you've heard of, DHA, EPA, and so on. These long chain omega-3s are what is bringing inflammation to an end, resolving it. And there's a big difference between resolving inflammation and being anti-inflammation. Anti-inflammation we don't want. We need it, right? For COVID, cancer cells, healing the wound. So it's really about modulating and controlling and letting our immune system figure this out. It's another really co-evolved intricate system uh, in human biology. So again, what we've really got is part of the human health plan right here if we can get it through the animal foods in our diet. Now, of course, salmon are a rich, rich source of omega-3s, but you out here in North Dakota, probably not salmon people, I'm guessing. Even where you can get salmon, the oceans are in trouble. We cannot rely on wild fisheries exclusively for omega-3s, okay? So this is why it's really important that what we choose to feed animals gets the fat balance right in the animal because this feeds to, into us and our immune systems. Okay, phytochemicals come into this picture, into the human microbiome because they feed on what we eat, what we send down our digestive tract. And some people ask me because there's like, what's with the donut? So my mic, should I be eating donuts? All right, explanation. No, your brain loves a donut, okay? The microbiome, all this stuff that's in the donut, it never gets down to where they live in your digestive tract. Uh, but what our microbiome, this is interesting, just like a ruminant, our microbiome thrives on fiber, whole plant foods. And we do not have the full genome to code for the enzymes to break down all of these plant foods. But guess who does? The human microbiome. And so here it is. This is where most, this is the heart of the human microbiome down here in the colon. It's not up here in the stomach. That's a really acidic environment. It is designed to kill pathogens and to keep crud from moving further down in your system. That's not where your microbiome is. So we take in carbohydrates, proteins, fats, all that stuff in our diet, and everything, for the most part, 
except for the unbroken down or partially broken down fibers in plant foods, it's gone, boom. It's passed out of your intestinal wall by the bottom of the small intestine. The rest of the stuff heads down to the colon where it is tranquil grazing pastures for your microbiome. And so this is primarily what they thrive on. And like the ruminant, you really want them thriving because they churn out all kinds of compounds and molecules based on what lands down there in the colon. So it is indeed another biological bazaar. And for better and worse, I don't, I don't advocate uh, something like a paleo diet or, or, or something like some other diet that's so-called plant-based because actually ruminants are plant-based food. What I advocate is something in line with human biology, which is this fantastic digestive system and brain and so on that allows us to eat as omnivores. That is what is really good for us. Now, of course, you want your animal foods, as I've nattered on about, fat balance, we want the plant foods in our diet, and this gets back to soil health, to be phytochemically rich. The reason for that is this. Fruits and vegetables are filled with all kinds of phytochemicals. And so we add to our plant-rich, not plant-exclusive, but add to your plant-rich diet the fat balance that we get in animal foods, and I think we're off to a good start. The fats, our body can absorb those directly, the omega-3s, the omega-6s that we need. The phytochemicals are embedded with the fiber in a whole plant food. This is why we not, it's not good to be eating refined plant foods. They've thrown the fiber out, and God knows what's happened to the phytochemicals. These two things are bound together, so you want to eat them together. So into the microbiome, down to the colon, a microbiome churns out all kinds of metabolites based on fermenting all of these fibers. There's way more in the, human, uh, in the hidden half about what some of these metabolites are uh, and their influence throughout our bodies. And so this really is part, another part of a person's health plan. So you sort of need to think about your microbiome um, as kind of tiny farmers and little tiny doctors and tiny pharmacists all down there so long as we're letting them thrive and survive and eat their preferred diet. All right, I want to move on to the Fab Four and close out here. So really what we know is that farming and ranching practices profoundly influence the Fab Four. I just went through all of that with the phytochemicals, the fats, and the metabolites. So this is a chief finding. Another finding of the book, as I've just summarized, this has huge influence on human health. And this is why I would really love to see a summit of doctors and ranchers and farmers so that we can begin to talk more about these connections so we can start to weave together ag policy with health policy, these two great endeavors, agriculture and medicine. All right, and I'll just say this. If all of this is swimming through your head and you can't remember things and you're wondering, one of the takeaways is that we have been embedded in nature forever and ever, ever since we came about as a species. From microbiomes, to the plants, to the animals, both wild and domesticated, they are a huge part of who we are. And it would really behoove us, I think, to pay attention to the ruminant, innate sort of ruminant biology, and also our own, because we've learned the more you fight with nature, you might win for a little while, but in the long run, it just usually doesn't work out all that well. And so really, when it comes to microbiomes, there's some common ground with ourselves, with ruminants, with the rhizosphere. They're all biological bazaars, these grand symbiotic relationships. And this is what we ought to be seeking to nourish and have germinate and be fully functioning. The microbial metabolites, Tiny pharmacists, we want to support them. It's a huge role in immunity and defense in plants, animals, people. And I always argue that this is really a form of intelligence that a lot more of us 
need to know about and avail ourselves of. It is, uh, tends to work better than pharmaceuticals, your own body. There's a whole chapter in the book on body wisdom. Your body can figure some of this stuff out on its own if it has the right context. And lastly, this is a really key takeaway too. If it's good for the land, for the terrain out there, it's good for ruminants and it's good for us. All right, this is the end. And if you, whether you've read any or all of the books, this is the shortest summary I could think of. Dirt is really the plight and the problem of what agriculture has presented to soils. The hidden half tells us some insights, some treatments, some cures, some restoration, regeneration, how we can get this part of nature back up and, fu and functioning on its feet. The how-to is what growing a revolution is about, and the stakes, the consequences, why all of this matters is in the latest book. All right, uh, Daryl, how are we on time? Do you think we've got any time for a question or two? Or you bet. I... We've got probably 10 minutes. Okay. And, and so we, oh, Greg's got a question right away. So, Ann, we got a room full of ranchers here, and uh, what would be the tips or advice you'd give this group to help do their part to make this healthy uh, plant uh, and fiber community you're, you're talking about here? Yeah, that's a good question, and um, I really like Jerry's remarks at the beginning, and one thing that struck me about why there's a struggle for this is that agriculture has become an endeavor too dominated by products and not with less integration and not enough integration of practices. And you can't all be sold, none of us can be sold a grassland. That is nature's making out there. And I've been thinking about that and that that's part of the difficulty. And I think what we really need to do is elevate practices is a really important part of agriculture. And that's not to say we're gonna do away with products. This is the modern world. You have all used products out there in agriculture. But what we're trying to do is get the right kind of products to be working with the practices that feed into soil health, nutrient dense, fat balanced, phytochemically rich animals. And the only way that is gonna happen is out on a grassland. And to the extent that any of you out there have connections into the healthcare community, uh, I don't need to tell you how the pandemic has stressed docs and nurses and so on. Uh, anything we can do to reduce the numbers of folks heading into the medical profession with various diet-related chronic conditions, that's a conversation very much worth having. I mean, we spend an awful lot uh, on healthcare in this country, and we have solutions beneath our feet, in our crops, and in our animals. So I think talking more about that, because I think that's a way to reach a consumer as well. Folks are getting educated enough now, and we're getting more nuance and understanding about the function of fats, and so we don't need to say anymore, here's the story, saturated fats are bad, beef are bad, beginning and end. No. We've been eating meat forever and ever. That one slide I showed you about the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, we need to get back to that. Our immune system is crying out for that. Our, our cognitive health, our quality of life as we age, all of that. So I think you start talking about those things, and guess what? Everyone is pretty interested in themselves. And so then you begin to think, well, what does this mean for me, and how do I get the word out? So talk, that's how, right? If we had phytochemicals, I'd be ginning up communication phytochemicals for you all now to soak up, go back out there into the world and be putting these words, paragraphs and stories together because it's the full story. Oh, Ted. As I understand it, uh, different plants have got a different balance between omega-3 and omega-6. 
And the grasses, uh, especially their seeds, are very heavy in omega-6s for dormancy. But some of the other plants, such as flax, uh, are using omega-3 for dormancy instead. And there's uh, other groups. And in a pasture, a lot of times when it's replanted, um, if you use something like a uh, uh, Roundup and then put just grasses in, aren't you moving very heavily into omega-6s? Uh, maybe there should be a diversity of the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your last point there, sh maybe shouldn't there be a diversity of plants out there because plant diversity relates not only to phytochemical diversity, but also to fat diversity. So that's, I don't know why you would, wouldn't utilize a natural ecosystem that has an awful lot of uh, indigenous phytochemical diversity already there and be working with that as opposed to trying to drill this and that plant into a system. Because sooner or later, what you drilled in never takes, the natives come back in and take over. And so this is where probably I imagine there's some animals in your herd, they're going for all the candy type plants, uh, probably more of those than, than these other native plants. And so, you know, paying attention to what your animal's preferences are, you could then, you know, feed that into breeding perhaps. And I, I just want to make a comment on the um, omega-3 story in plants. Yes, some plants do have omega-3s. Flax is one, canola, chia seed, walnuts are a seed. They happen to be, uh, they got a lot of omega-6s, but they also have a really nice amount of omega-3s. The deal with omega-3s is these fats are carbon and hydrogen molecules hooked together with either single or double bonds. And the most functional, these short little fats, they, they're functional, but they're these short little fats. They don't do a whole lot. As you start to add carbons onto a fatty acid, you get more and more functionality out of that plant. And so what plants, their omega-3s tend to be medium length chains. What the ruminants can do through ruminant biology and a diet rich in omega-3s is they can add on to the length of these fats, which are the fully functional, super duper kind of a fat that does all kinds of things in the animal body. The other th thing is that people often say, well, I'm just gonna be eating all plants. It's like, that's fine. <laughs> you can go and chew for eight hours a day and try and get all of the nutrition that a ruminant gets out of plants and you will never ever win. That is a futile task. Why not let the animal vegetable miracle system do that for you? And so that's part of my um, understanding of what plant-based food really is. It's coming out of ruminant biology in the right habitat. Okay, so my name is Marco. I'm a professor at Bismarck State College and Dickinson State University. I teach uh, soil sciences to future um, agronomists and you know in the professionals in, in industry. Um, and uh, I kind of try to teach new tools that are available out there. Some of these tools are used to control the microbiome, right? To make it more efficient, quote unquote. For example, in agronomy, we will use agritane, that is a urease inhibitor, trying to, you know, more efficient use of nitrogen. But what I have seen, I, I will do this setup, these experiments with kids. We will use agritane, we will not use the agritane. And then, yes, you will say, we will see more efficient release of nitrogen. But then the microbial community suffers. So we will see even fungi and overall diversity decreasing as, a use, as we use some of these products. So we are sacrificing the microbiome's diversity versus some of these, what we consider ourselves efficiency. Uh, but now I'm cons concerned that I, I went through a, a whole set of policies of what sustainable agriculture is and involves, let's say, feeding our animals, ruminants with methanogenic, uh, uh, con or to control methanogenic bacteria in ruminants. And that, that's another form of efficiency. And 
my question is, that what do you think about this? Um, is the, are we overthinking it? Or should we just focus on diversity and let the nature take its course? You probably know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the rumen and microbiomes are some of the most dynamic areas of biology that we know about. You have, especially with the ruminant, you got different feedstocks, so to speak, these combinations and levels of different plants that they can choose to eat for self-medication and self-health purposes. Uh, I'm not sure anybody understands all there is to know about that, but when we get in there and start tinkering for the sake of efficiency with particular members of the microbiome, we don't fully understand what it is that we are doing. And so killing off methanogens, so these happen to be uh, one of the microbes that was up on that slide. These are archaea. These are some of the most ancient microorganisms that are known. Right? Biology is mercilessly efficient on its own, and those methanogens are doing things for the animal that if it weren't good or at least neutral for the animal, evolution would have kicked these methanogens out of the room and long, long ago. And so my beef, so to speak, with trying to manipulate, whether it's the soil microbiome, the ruminant microbiome, or for that matter, even the human microbiome, is it's too dynamic. Stuff is changing minute to minute, depending on what the feedstock is, depending on what the turnover is with a particular microbial population. And, it, and so what I advocate and what I would like to see is continuing research and understanding, not so much for manipulative purposes, but like I had said earlier, for safeguarding and conserving and ensuring normally functioning microbiome for that individual animal, for that particular crop, for that particular person. Because the other thing we know is there is a lot of diversity out there across the human population. People often say about domesticated plants and animals, oh, come on, they're just all the same. It's just all standardized. I mean, no. There is something about biology, and diversity will always reign, and that's why it's folly in some ways to try to think we can get uh, you know a lasso around this thing and bend it to our will and get it to be so you know so-called more efficient we don't understand about efficiency is at some point that intersects with the line of the health of the animal and then you're into all kinds of other problems so we want animal vegetable miracle we don't want animal vegetable disastrous right and so uh, you know, my money is with the microbiome and supporting it as best we can and as we continue to learn.